So good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for joining today's uh, webinar, which is focused on how technology developments are impacting the traditional broker channel, both positively and, and perhaps sometimes presenting new challenges. This is a topic which has very much been on the minds of the industry recently. Uh, thank you to the many people who have offered their questions. So your, your assistance in helping us to focus the sessions really, really invaluable. Thank you also to NetSol, who um, are our joint partners in today's webinar. So we're delighted to have Jason with us from, from NetSol. NetSol have created an app store of pre-made leasing components called Apex Now. And we'll be giving you details of that website after the event, but it's... Uh, you know, it's really good. It's an impressive site. So it's well worth having a look if you, you haven't done already. So it, it's opened up a, a new opportunity for brokers to access uh, leading leasing technology in their businesses without uh, having to bring to the website big budgets or or having uh, the infrastructure to, to, to run large complex IT programs uh, and projects. So initial uptake on their solutions have been very positive, creating easy access to tech that helps brokers run uh, their businesses more efficiently, uh, efficiently, excuse me, and enhance service to their customers and demonstrate ongoing compliance with lending processes without material impact on their business models. So we know from the number of people who've joined today that these digital sessions are, are of great interest to the UK asset finance community. Um, please um, ask questions through the event. Um, it helps to keep the, the topics relevant and to make sure that we answer the questions that you want answered. So we hope that through running these community events, both online and in person, we'll help spark ideas in the industry, ideas that will drive new businesses, grow profits and deliver better outcomes for our customers. So today's session will consist of three parts. So basically, um, it comes down to the where, to the why, the where, and the how. So why? Many brokers have run very successful businesses with a phone and a contact list. So we're going to start today by having a, a talk about what's changed. Why do they suddenly need tech? Or can they just carry on with their phone and their contact list? And that's it. Um, so the, the, that's the first section. The second section is the where, what are the needs of different brokers for applying technology? So what should you focus on? Where in the, in the origination process should you be thinking about using tech to add value? And the final bit is the how, how do you do it? And for that, we'll be relying on, um, on Jason from, from NetSol to uh, really take us through how they're approaching providing a product suite for, for brokers. And we think you'll find that very interesting too. So that's enough from me. David, over to you. All right, thank you very much indeed, Edward. And good afternoon, everyone from myself. Um, this is actually the second part of a uh, of a two-part series on brokers and their, and their relationship with the industry. The first part was on the 16th of April when we focused on the certification process for asset finance brokers which John Philip, who the FLA chairman, announced at the FLA dinner in February. Uh, I guess a number of you on the call today will have been at that dinner and probably on the webinar also. Um, that was a really insightful session. I guess many of you online saw that and we did receive excellent reviews. So we know there's really strong interest from the broker community regarding the future direction of brokers and what they uh, and, their, and their role in the industry. As Edward mentioned, we're going to split this session into three parts. We'll start each panel, each session with a poll question, and that sort of sets the scene for the, the questions that we'll have. So we'll have sort of three 15-minute uh, minute sections. Um, but talking about the panel, I think it's important that I should introduce them to you, first of all, uh, so we all get to know them a little bit. Um, so uh, we've got, the first of all, on the panel, we've got Astrid Michael. She's the head of sales asset finance United Trust Bank. Uh, good afternoon, Astrid. Um, Astrid's worked in the asset finance industry for 20 years as a highly experienced professional with a strong track record of success working with funders including ING and most re recently Hitachi Capital Business Finance where she was sales manager for farm and cross-channel delivery. Um, we've got Tom Perkins who's director and co-founder of Charles and Dean and over 10 years Tom's been a noteworthy leader in asset, the asset finance space delivering talks and sharing knowledge 
against a plethora of platforms. We know him to be an influential figure when it comes to disrupting outdated trends and driving finance for SMEs across the UK. Um, so the note says his ever-present dynamism um, permeates even the furthest branches of the Charles and Dean community, inspiring our endeavour to provide unique, tailored solutions. So certainly in our in our calls, Tom, when we had the sat letters, you're definitely a lively, lively chap. So I would uh, I would endorse that comment. <laughs> um, we've got Andy Taylor. Um, I think Andy's been on one or two of these calls before, so he's recently well known. Um, great to see you again, Andy. Um, Andy's career began with Northwest Bank, and he had stints with GE Capital and also with ING Lease, and more recently with the with Hitachi Capital Business Finance, where you were head of sales. Haydock hey, and has taken responsibility for structuring the national sales strategy, which has underpinned the company's ambitious growth plans and contributed to a record loan book size of over 600 million. He successfully implemented a strong nationwide team of relationship managers, a specialist agricultural offering, two defined channels for vendor and structured plus a stock, stock finance offering now serving 91 dealers. Um, and finally, we've got Jason Hurwitz. Jason is the sales director of Europe Netsol Technologies. Jason began his career as an investment banker in the equity derivative, derivative division at UBS. And prior to this role, he worked with Oldermore for almost six years, where he was product lead for a large group wide transformation program and also at Close Brothers, where he led several transformation programs also and facilitated strategic relationship development, growth initiatives, and long term strategy development. Jason also has experience as a business founder and entrepreneur, providing him with unique insights into the end customer value in SME lending and banking. Jason is now Sales Director Europe for NetSol and he's helping to use the expertise that he's gained over the years uh, in major UK lessons to drive growth, uh, growth across the leasing value chain. So welcome, Jason, and thank you very much indeed to NetSol for sponsoring today's uh, webinar. So Edward, let's start with the first poll question, please. Okay, here we go. So the question is: Brokers need to lend uh, need to invest enough in enough technology to meet the expectations of both customers and their lenders, and to avoid being disintermediated. So we want to know how much you agree with that. Whether you strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, or something even more extreme. So if you could answer that now. Great. So uh, we'll come back to after we've done the first session. We'll come back to the answers on that uh, on that session, and then we'll uh, then we'll take it from there. And as Edward said in his opening remarks, um, we do really like to have questions from the delegates, and Edward will be looking at those questions, and again, we'll bring those in at the end of each uh, end of each section section. So let's get let's get going then. So Tom, can I go to you first? Um, now, when we had the prep call earlier this week, you came over to me as a, a very tech savvy uh, young gentleman. Um, so, so this is a kind of a, a, a very techy question for you, I suppose. Um, and we we know that a lot of brokers, probably not you actually, but a lot of brokers uh, view technology with some suspicion because they think that broker business is a people business. I you know, just need a phone and an email and so on and so forth. And they also some brokers feel that the march of technology is a bit of a risk for that. Um, you know that 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 person-to-person -person, um, relationship. Um, so what's your view? I mean, do you think it's a risk or is it is it the way forward? Uh, thanks, David. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think this sort of uh, concern around uh, technology taking over the broken job and we're all going to be out of jobs in three years when AI is, you know, making uh, the decisions for us, I think it's just ludicrous. I think... Uh, I think we need to understand where we sit in the supply chain. You know, we're we're an origination business and a distribution business. And ultimately, a technology can very much enhance both of those areas of our business. So um, I think it's important that we look to embrace and become as tech enabled as we can. Um, there are so many benefits that we can uh, use tech for from a compliance point of view, from a, an efficiency drive perspective. Um, and obviously, you know, distribution with a, a, an ever growing crowded marketplace of funders is, you know, posing more of a challenge uh, as a broker than it's ever done. So, you know, having tech uh, help support that distribution, I think, uh, plays a vital role. Okay, and is, it, and is it the same? Do you think it's the same attraction for big brokers as, as small brokers, or is it different? I just, you know, when we talk about this sort of topic of technology, it's not really a one size fits all for all brokers. You know, there'll be lots of people on this call who'll be, um, you know, uh, sort of individual brokers operating with their client base, and there'll probably be people here offering fairly large operations. And I think, 
it's wrong to associate tech with everybody because tech is something that is there to enhance and enable. And, you know, how that enhances and enable an individual broker versus that of a large operation is very, very different. I think the main barrier to entry is generally some cost anxiety. I think I can definitely share that experience of, um, you know, recognizing that technology could play a vital role in my business and evolving it forward. But there's some costing anxiety around that in terms of, you know, are we going to sink a lot of money into something we just don't know whether it's going to have a direct benefit um and so i think there's a journey to go on as a community to try and explore a tech and, and have the confidence to explore tech so you know endorsing operate opportunities like this to talk about it in as a, as a community i think is really positive okay great thanks so if i can move to andy now andy i know you're not anti-tech but you definitely um see the value in i think you coined the phrase some time ago storybook lending so you very much see that value in in person to person and into interaction um so for you you know, how do you see technology? Is technology, I mean, you definitely agree with Tom that you're an origination business, there's no argument there, but I, I, I suspect you're maybe not quite as enthusiastic about technology as well, maybe Tom is. Well, I am, I am, David, I'm really enthusiastic about tech, but I think it's got to be technology with a purpose. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the tech I've seen in the past four or five years is, um, you know, not, not really, well, I, I've, people will have heard me say this before it's been some of the tech's been trying to solve the problem that i'm not aware i've got really um you know i'd I like to know that if there's something out there that can help us and, and help us develop then then of course I'm, I'm all for that um so i think i think it should enable the brokers really for, for me to easier process the easy deals um and give them time to work on the harder deals um hey Doc, recently we did a, a training video with our brokers and we asked them very direct questions about what was important to them and, and what their customers wanted from them and it's clear now to me that, that a lot of brokers, the majority of brokers are now no longer order takers, David. They are trusted business partners and advisors um, and customers more and more call the broker because they've got a problem that they need um, expert advice to solve. They've not just got a, a, a 40 grand truck that they want to buy. They've got a problem and, and you know various finance products, including asset finance, invoice finance and, and other products can help them you know, solve that problem. And, and I think the customer's expectations have changed as well, the SMEs, because they don't have a bank manager anymore in the traditional sense, so they do need the broker to perform that role. But for me, go back to the first thing I said, you know, tech can help that by taking away, you know, the easy parts, that, that you know, the, the, the 25, 30 grand deal for the customer for a car that, that really doesn't need any time or effort by anybody. But that should enable the broker then to, um, you know, collectively, you know, spend more time on the deals that do need more time. Um, but but so we're thinking about the customer then. So when the customer's having that interaction from the broker, and you talked a little bit there about the customer's expectations have changed, and we all know customer behaviour changes. I mean, it's a it's an ongoing process. I mean, do the customers, when they're talking with the broker, do they expect to have a more tech-enabled conversation with them? Do they, do they expect it to be, um, rather than on the phone, do they expect it to be, um, you, know, um, you know, a video call or something like that? Is How is that changing? Well, I think inevitably, David, there'll be, there'll be a mixture of the two. But, you know, one thing we've seen in asset finance in the past five years, which has been fantastic, is a lot of new, younger people coming into the industry. Mm -hmm. So if that's happening in asset finance, then that's clearly happening um, with SMEs as well. Now, you know, m my daughters are 26 and 22. You know, they do everything by the phone. So it stands to reason that the SMEs will want to start to do a lot more by their phones, their apps. However, I, you know, I, I do still think, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm... I'm I'm pretty sure most people will agree that there does still need to be that element of human touch. I mean, who on this call and, and, and the delegates could actually put the hand up and say they've enjoyed an experience with a bot? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Not me, so I've, I've, I definitely don't know on that one. So we could we could maybe put a separate poll question in on that, Edward. <laughs> um, okay, Andy, but that's great. Thank you very much, Denise. So Astrid, coming to you, do you, um, so you've seen, you've sort of seen there, Astrid, sort of not, exactly two sides of the same coin, but you've seen two different viewpoints. So um, so you're obviously a lender. So, do you know, what's your what's your expectation of the use of the from the from the broker? So if you've got a broker, for instance, who's very tech savvy, is that does that make life easier for you? Or can you can you handle the tech savvy broker and the, the broker who still wants to live in the story of a lending era? Yeah, I mean, I think the the expectation, you know, varies by lender, um, you know, and their own tech. Um, and I, I would say it's a it's a preference rather than an expectation. Um, you know, certainly, 
UTB want to be able to service both and not, you know, force brokers down a tech path that just doesn't, you know, work from them as, as the guys have already said, you know, tech, you know, can be used and, and, and should be used for the, the transactional stuff, you know, the easy wins, the, the stuff that isn't value add, you know, getting out that 40k van, you know, that the customer needs there and then, but, you know, freeing up that time to sit down and go, right, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Customer, what's your plans this year? You know, where, where are your business aspirations? You know, what are your challenges and how can I, you know, support that? And, and tech, you know, won't, won't ever replace that human interaction. Um, you know, I think on, on a tech uh, aspect and, and around lenders' expectation, I think, um, you know, speaking from my own view here that, you know, I think we expect brokers are keeping good records and evidencing that customer journey. Um, you know, journey from a regulatory and compliance um, aspect. Uh, and I think that's definitely where tech can be you know, hugely beneficial in, in that regard. So that, that compliance area and record keeping, we're going to come on to that later in, mm. the, later in, the, later in the session. And, and indeed, it, I, I do agree with you. And I think everybody would agree that it's a, a really important um, issue for all parties that are involved in the, in the customer value chain. So, so Jason, coming to you. Um, you're obviously uh, you're the you're the technologist uh, on the on the panel. Um, where do you see the uh, where do you see the demand coming from? Are you seeing the demand for more tech coming from the brokers, or are you seeing it from the vendors? Where, where's the demand coming from? I don't think it's a binary choice in that sense. I think in, traditionally, uh, Netsol um, has been focused on lenders and of all varieties and providing lending technology to them, but. With this new suite of products, which we can talk more about later, Apex Now, we've we've now built um, like some capabilities to enable brokers to access technology and do that in a simple and easy way. So, from a demand, and we're seeing a lot of demand in that space at the moment. And I think the reason is, and I touched on it, I think briefly in the opening. Um, Brokers are becoming larger organizations, so the need for efficiency is, is increasing. Um, it's just a normal matur maturation curve. Um, I think customer expectations are definitely changing. So you've got brokers that are increasingly thinking about how to include tech. And it isn't to replace the customer journey, it's to include technology in the customer journey. You know, I, think, I don't think anyone is really striving for a shopping cart asset finance business model. I have one of those and two of those, and one of them needs to be birthday wrapped and sent there. You know, that's not what we're aiming for. Uh, what we're saying is, look, you know, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, think about technology. We don't have to think about it as every corner of the customer journey uh, is, is, is automated. That's not it. It's where, where can we use technology in the customer journey to complement the human expertise where it matters? So I think that's that customer expectation change, changing piece is really important. And the third bit which we've touched on is also is on, on, the, on the compliance bit. There's an increasing very hot topic and naturally the regulators has increasing obligations on lenders to demonstrate um, that everyone in their value chain is performing to the rules and so if we need to provide more evidence around that you can either do that in a really manual way and it'd be quite hard work for brokers to gather all that information every time for every lender or they can have a system that, that, that has an audit trail that says that we did this then and that doesn't mean you have to automate every step you're doing it just means it needs to be done within a, within a systemized process that captures the steps so there's a lot of a lot of value, I think, for, for technology um, in a lot of different ways, but it needs to be thought through and, and where and think about where technology can add value um, to, to what is a fundamentally and always will be a human expertise led model. So thinking about you, you know, use the term uh, steps in the process. So, um, you know, um, there's a lot of talk in certainly in the retail world about omni channels. So customers like they like to do some stuff offline because they may like to touch it and feel it and have a look at it and so forth. And but they, a lot of the stuff they like to do online and particularly sale of financial services, financing, very much more to online. So you see the future of tech enabling that kind of omni-channel experience, or do you see, see the future as being completely? No, I, th for, for, I think it's. I think you have to look at it across the customer journey and then identify where in that journey where tech can add value, uh, or indeed where the or the inverse of that, which is the most important question, 
where does um, uh, our human expertise add most value and where is it a waste of time? You know, is there any value in, uh, is there value in human expertise putting an arm around an SME customer who's quite unsure about the next purchase, quite unsure potentially about taking out a PG and someone putting an arm around them and really explaining it to them, understanding what it is, getting into what their needs are, what they're trying to achieve and giving them reassurance that it will guide them to the right solution from the right lending partner. And yes, absolutely. Is there value in that human, that human then keying in that data in three different places in order to get the answer to, to the credit question? No. <laughs> and in fact, it's expensive use of resource and it's just not required. So it's about thinking about where, where the value is for technology and human expertise and where it isn't and marrying the two. Yeah. Okay. So picking up on that word value. So one of the, certainly, I think everybody would agree, one of the values that technology delivers is in the compliance area. So you get, if you've got a digital journey, you get a digital audit trail. So um, you know, both sides can use that if there's any kind of complaint or anything. I mean, um, maybe just throw this final question in this session over to the panel, talk about compliance. Um, you know, is the, is the, the, the digital audit trail is that really really useful and does that mean that as time goes on there'll be maybe less personal interaction and more digital interaction because you've got that you've got that digital record i don't know anybody wants to pick that one up andy i'm looking at you really yeah i'm i'm fine to pick that up david yeah i think i mean of course it's useful uh you know i think we're, we're ever moving towards um you know I'll, I'll talk about my part of the world specifically so asset finance you know the fla are doing work around um, the audits, which we which we covered in the last mm -hmm. session, um, which will be digital. Um, the NACFB, which you know I'm part of, also um, do audits for their um, broker members. So you know the, the more of the journey that can be evidenced by digital audits has got to be helpful with compliance um, and conduct. Um, I think you know I think it, that was a word that, that when we had a, a talk about this a few days ago came up quite a bit as well. Is, is conduct? You know I think there's. The compliance is great, but we, we need to keep our keep our eyes firmly on the conduct of, of everybody, brokers and lenders alike. Yeah. Okay. And and I think from uh, Jason, from what you were saying, from a, you know from a net sort perspective, then um, you know the you know this digital the digital audit audit trail is is engineered. I think you would agree into all of your products. So um, that's uh, that's a, an important sort of added value. That's well, it's a. Um, you know, it's not an extra, it's a kind of almost like a hygiene factor for the products that you you provide. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, if we can put, we can, if we can put a man on the moon, we can certainly, yeah. as a human race, we can certainly create a, the, the, the systems in order to hit a button to say, this is what happened in this customer's journey, what the customer was advised and when and how, how the process went and when, when they received the GDPR statement, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, it, all this stuff is inherent and built in and you know, we've got, cloud-based solutions, the, the data architecture is very, very clear, the integration is really high and it's dead easy. So th this concept of, oh, here comes another lender who wants to see um, all everything we've done and wants to pull the drains up and everything, doesn't have to be a week-long exercise. It could, you know, can, I want to say we can get it to a click of a button, but it can be certainly in, towards that direction where you just say, here is what I did. Yeah, and get up the and that saves a, a lot of time and it also also can save a lot of money as well actually so that's important so um so we'll we'll close this first section uh there's been quite a few questions coming through edward there was yeah one um one one of them um is is about the nature of the interaction um uh, and somebody's asking is the digital um is the customer that's using digital or prefers digital having a different type of interaction with brokers and therefore the service that they have to provide, is that going to be different? Um, or is it just digitalizing the same journey? Uh, I, I don't know, Astrid, do you want to, to pick that up? <laughs> so it's a question of, are they treated differently by a broker. I guess it's uh, are, are the needs of the uh, of a younger. Uh, what this the question is asking is is this younger group who prefer to to interact digitally are their needs different? Do they want different things to? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I've got, I think you know the needs of of customers, um, you know, have changed. Um, you know, just both from you know the way that the world is at the minute. You know, I think people want to um, you know do stuff quickly with ease they want to self-serve stuff um especially the simple stuff and they want to do this you know on their phones throughout you know any time of the day um 
and um so i think that uh, you know that's that's a big difference um really okay um well look i've, I've got three other questions that have come in but uh, and one of them is um are, is the broker community able to identify the the pain points which can be solved by tech and really i think that that is the um that's the where coming up and we've had two other questions that are, are, are around how brokers would do it small brokers and and um uh, and others and it, could there be an out of the box solution or do you all need different solutions and i and i think that's the why so um i'm not ignoring your questions because i think they're great questions and they're the things that we're going to deal with in the the two next sections so if i can move over to the the poll um, the question was, brokers need to invest in enough technology to meet the expectation of customers and lenders and to avoid being disintermediated. And it's a very clear message that 80%, 87% agree or strongly uh, or strongly agree that, um, uh, that that's the case and uh, a measly 3% disagree. So that's where we are on that. Do you want me to do the next poll, David? Yes, please, carry on poll questions. Okay. So I'm just going to share that for two seconds. I should have done that earlier, apologies. Okay, so let me move on to poll two. Um, and that poll question is uh, about the uh, where, so where do you apply it? And the, the, here's the question. So customers and vendors will expect brokers to be able to interact digitally, email and telephone will be supplanted, supplemented by digital meetings, instant messaging and next generation tools for interaction. So we're asking whether it's really in the communication bit that 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 digital um can um can uh, can work and we want to know whether you strongly agree agree and so on with that so you should have that now and um, back to you david yeah i would uh, i would s suspect i know the answer to that poll question judging by the answer to the first one I think, but we'll have to see yeah. um so we're into section two now. This is kind of like the where section, you know, this where should brokers use tech? So um, when we uh, did quite a lot of research before this this webinar and the, the feedback we got from brokers was probably three, there were probably three areas where they saw opportunities to use tech. Uh, first one, is, unsurprisingly, was winning more business and improving the customer journey. Um, the second one was reducing costs and saving time. Um, and, you know, I think we heard Astrid from you that, you know, you found that brokers who use more tech are probably easier to deal with. So um, so I think we can understand that one as well. Um, and then the third one, the third big area that we came across was conduct and compliance that Andy, you pointed out um, in the first section. So it was getting more business, reducing costs, making the whole thing more efficient. And secondly, you know, uh, ongoing concerns about ensuring that, you know, the, the service that's provided is compliant. Um, but Tom, could I come to you first again this time? And we spoke in the first session about maybe some differences between big brokers and small brokers. But if we can drill it down to the individual deal, um, you know, some some brokers work on low volume, high value deals, other brokers might work on low value, high volume deals. Um, is the does tech enable both? Or I mean, kind of in my mind, I can think. If it's very high volume, it's probably more related to tech. If it's very low volume, it's maybe a little bit more storybook. I don't know, but what's your view on that? Yeah, look, I think uh, as we kind of already discussed as well, we've touched on the fact that there is a such a breadth of different sort of intermediary activities going on. We've got sort of high volume flow activities versus complex arm around the shoulder, kind of replacing the the you know the the bank manager type broker as well. So. I think technology will obviously have a have a different application. All of that. Um, I, I one of the things you know we, we've adopted is is doing a bit of deal type categorizing. So if we're looking at different deal types that we operate through our business, there'll be there'll be deal types that we believe are relatively high volume, low value, high, low friction. So those sort of low friction deals hopefully rely on fairly limited human input and hopefully rely on a fairly low level of skill to transact. So in those in that instance, we'd obviously want to try and use as much technology to drive that customer experience, because as we said, there are very di digital enabled customers out there who want to experience that type of journey. So we want to try and uh, create a, an environment for people to engage with us at that level. But then we obviously we have uh, other types of clients who will typically have far more complex uh, requirements and that requires, you know, our human capital, the people that we invest and train up and skill up to try and deploy that skill into the, those high value, 
uh, high friction, uh, high complexity opportunities. So it's just trying to pull levers where we bif- where we feel that uh, technology is best suited. It doesn't suit every corner of our business model, far from it, but it definitely does uh, help drive efficiency in other areas. I think, um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, uh, you know, a far more crowded marketplace of funders now. So easier for brokers to have more access at high level. That clearly means that the SMEs have more availability to funding. So that's good news. But arguably now the, the the opportunity for a broker to add value in my opinion is better now than it's ever been because if there's more opportunity out there for funding and more availability to funding but it's dem- but it's delivered through a very crowded marketplace of funders there is a strong value proposition for a broker to act as that point of uh, point of information and guide them through those that you know that crowded marketplace so I think there's a, a real strong value proposition now than there has ever been. But naturally, we need to also address the compliance pieces of Roku, which is how can we demonstrate impartial and non-biased behavior, uh, which we all know can sometimes be, you know, brokers can sometimes be creatures of habit. And, you know, we can use technology to try and adopt better behavior, better culture um, by having some level of automation or some level of technology influencing our distribution to the market. Um so there's, there's there's lots of different levels to this. I, I think the three points you referred to, David, are really valid. I think becoming more tech enabled means we can generate more opportunity. We can uh, generate more origination channels, more acquisition partners. Um, obviously, operationally, there's an operational cost to transact deals. So obviously, if I can lean that up through automation and using, um, you know, just things like uh, uh, using e-sign docs for various customer facing documentation, it's a small win, but it helps improve the customer experience um, through the sales process. And then obviously, from a compliance perspective, there's things like ID, uh, you know, ID verification technologies out there, meaning we can be you know, even more robust in terms of, you know, trying to catch uh, on, on on any sort of um, uh, uh, um, what am I trying to say? The uh, uh, sorry. Um, so, just while you get your thoughts back, so I mean, do you? And I think this is a question to the whole panel. I mean, there are you know the high volume, relatively low value deals versus the low volume, relatively relatively high value deals. Do you, does the panel think that you're going to see? Two different types of brokers emerging, or you're going to have one broker that deals in in both, in both channels, or, or is it the channel going to be too specialised that that's where you the broker has to go has to be either in one channel or another channel? I don't know. I may start on that one if I, if I can, Andy. If that's right, yeah, that's true. Um, it's been, obviously, you have some experience with this from Aldermore and Close Brothers also. Um, I don't mean this, and excuse that I don't mean this as a, as a pun, but it's not as straightforward as a binary question like that. I think you can look at it as the deal shape, as the, the, the driver between where you, where, how you deploy technology or not. And often that is the case, but not always. You know, I take the example of um, broker goes out to meet a, a small scale haulier. The first deal, they might need to put an awful lot of uh, attention and reassurance around that customer, possibly the second deal too. But it does the same level of attention is the same level of attention required for the third and the fourth truck that that, that guy needs or, 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 or lady? Um, or does he would he be quite happy because he already knows you, knows the process, trusts the broker just to transact much more quickly and much more digitally on that third time? So it's not, you know, that might be the same shape deal. It might look like the same data coming through, but the, the, the need for, for the, the face-to-face bit might be slightly reduced in that scenario. And I say that just as an example of, I think you touched on, I think earlier, David, where you talked about omni-channel, you know, the, the ability to have different routes to reach different customers in different ways. You know, SMEs, uh, brokers alike, are not homogenous groups of people. They're, 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 they're no more, you know, so it, you've got to have different tools in your bag to meet different customer expectations at different times. And I think that, that, that for sure, the need for technology uh, is is there. Um, to meet customer expectations, but I think it's if you if you've got only got one tool in your bag, then it, then you might not be able to meet all the needs of all your customers at all different times. Yeah. So talking about different different channels, and one question I wanted to ask you, Jason, was I mean, you know, I'm you know my background is auto, so we're trying to keep off that today. But the I need to ask you one question about the auto side. So a lot of OEMs, well, all the OEMs have experimented with agency, for instance, and the reason and the reason they want. There's a couple of reasons why they like agency. One, they see it takes a lot of cost out of the distribution of the vehicle. Agency gives them more control over the customer. They, you know, they can control the customer. The OEM can control the customer cradle to grave. 
Um, so, and Netsol are very involved in uh, auto. You've got a lot of auto, um, you know, um, platforms out there. And so, does that, when you've got a situation with auto where you've got the OEMs who are trying to control the journey, is that a different? Is that a different tech challenge, or or is it the same challenge as uh, you know, as tech is delivering? Yeah, I think from a from a tech perspective, it's, a, it's you're just configuring to a different use case. Um, you know, there are in the, in the same way as different lenders have different different customer journeys. They want to create as will brokers um, as they more and more adopt technology. There doesn't have to be a one size fits all solution. And, and the great thing about the tech that we all enjoy these days is it's you know, cloud based, component based, and highly configurable. So I think you know what 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 you can have is the, the core fundamental pieces of the puzzle but the way in which you assemble them and the way in which you sort of d deliver the experience across it can vary quite wildly in a good way with that what that allows for is a high level of differentiation for for, for those participants in the value chain so sort of coming around the question slightly differently and saying look you know, it's it's there are similarities naturally um, in terms of capturing data for an application understanding a customer understanding an asset doing your kyc checks contracting fulfillment you know, uh, uh, and then uh, and then um, you know, paying out a deal of course but there are the nuances around that are quite significant and as long as you've got the right technology that allows you to configure the clicks not code um uh, and to create differentiation then that's that's what you need yeah. because what, what what people often think about technologies oh god you know i'm not going to be able to apply my own stamp on it i'm not going to be able to create uh, my own brand or my own value and that's just not the case anymore it used to be used to be you kind of had to take something and, and just follow whatever it does but not these days and i think that's an important message for brokers. a lot of the broker uh, business is, is around vehicles and they end up dealing with the oems and the oems i think are on a mission to you know control more of that journey so i think that's an important message for the brokers that are listening in and um, could we just in this one in this kind of the where category could we maybe just change direction a bit and come to you astrid and one of the big areas where technology is making a big difference is in credit approval. Um, so, um, and I'm thinking particularly about pre-qualification tools and so on and so forth that you that you may or may not use, or certainly a lot of, a lot of lenders use, um, um, and they work with the brokers using tech to ensure that, um, that, that those pre-qualification tools are populated with the right information. Is that something that is that something that you use a lot? And, and, and what, how do you see the future of, pre-qualification in the industry? So, I mean, we don't use uh, anything like that, to, you know, at the moment, that's not to say that we, that we never will, but, you know, I think I'll start, you know, the role of a broker and the skill of a broker is to first understand the customer, their needs, the kind of their profile, understand their lending panel, you know, the appetite in their lending panel and go, okay, best endeavors, you marry well with this person, you know, that deal go away, it's super inefficient, and not treating the customer very fairly, but super in inefficient for both the broker and the, and the lender to have, you know, props sort of sent here and everywhere and back and forth because it's not quite right. Um, you know, so, and I think there's also a lot of newer and younger brokers in the market, which is great. It's, you know, it's great to see, you know, that coming through, um, but potentially haven't had, you know, some of the same level of, of training and experience that some of the, um, you know, I say older the ogs the original brokers the ones that have been around for a long time have had so you know i think that's where tech can really come in and help to use to support you know that understanding of assessing uh you know assessing credit worthiness um and then and matching it uh, up with the the appropriate lender i think you know that that's a win for for everyone okay can i pose the same question to tom and andy then i mean so the you know what's the What's the role of tech in, um, you know, in improving customer service, uh, reducing the cost of service, so on and so forth? And, and how do you see the, the use of tech um, that might be delivered by, by, by NetSol to actually to enable you to do that filtering or pre-qualification is important for you? So, David, um, really following on from, from what Astrid said, so, you know, I think, I think ourselves as a funder um, over the past few years, we've seen our proposal acceptance conversion rates deteriorate. Um, and I think as a funder, I'll put my hand up and take my responsibility of that because our service levels haven't always been great. And, and at times you have to, you know, I can fully understand why the broker doesn't trust the funder to get back with an answer quick enough and, and, and things like that. So 
I think that's one side of it. I think the other side of it is is what Astrid touched on is that, you know, I'd like to think that there might be a way that technology can help some of our younger, enthusiastic and, and extremely talented brokers um, learn more about, um, you know, what I learned in, in a time long time ago in NWS Bank, um, you know, and, and lots of others of us learned in, in, you know, Lombard and other places like that. So I think, I think um, you know, I wonder, is there a way that tech can, can play a part in, the, in that part of, of our industry, really? Because, you know, it's no good for anybody that, that we're getting, you know, 50 props a day, agreeing 20 and, and paying out five. That's that's not good. So, you know, if we can if we can try and have an approach to affect that in a positive manner, that, that would be really, really helpful. You, you kind of opened a different area there, something that we've not considered on this webinar, and um, it's something we might we might talk about in a future one. It's about the edu training and education. So um, I think what you're saying there is technology enables younger people, it probably makes the industry more attractive, enables younger people to come up to speed more quickly. And when they're up to speed, they can provide a better service to the customer. Well, well, I think it'd be really helpful, David. And I'm, you know, I'm clearly not going to name names, but sometimes when I see brokers advertising on LinkedIn, come and join me and be an AR, what's the barrier of entry? Who's, who's checking who these people are what, what, you know how are you verifying that they're suitable capable principles should be doing that there's more the principal's got more responsibility now uh, from the fca of course so but yeah but it's working out is another matter yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but that's an area that's something that we could definitely uh, edward we could definitely have a look at about the, the training <laughs> education piece um, so just be finally before we we before we close this session on the where where should brokers use tech? Um, Jason, could I come to you about the just on the compliance area? So you know when regulations change, um, you know Netsol will have to change their platform to ensure that the regulation the new rules are followed. Um, is that does that make it? If you've got a broker who's dealing with somebody like Nexol, uh, who's a, a large operation, you know, with multiple applications, you, if you've got a regulation change, you only need to do it once, and then you can apply it to all your different customers. So you probably do it more quickly. You probably do it better. You probably have no mistakes, and because you're spreading it over a number of customers, you can probably do it at less cost. Is that would you say that was an advantage rather than if you compared with somebody who's running their own proprietary in-house system? Absolutely. I mean, one, there's an efficiency point. So if you've got technology, you can help meet your, your compliance obligations. We've been doing that for a long time with lenders and we're now able to do it with brokers. But you're right, these are subscription services. Yeah, these are cloud-based subscription services. So we can apply uh, the latest you know, uh, requirements to meet regulation and, and, and give that to all customers that have the product. And that comes as part of the subscription. So that, that's a real benefit there. You haven't got to then buy and redevelop your product or, or adapt some of these requirements you, you will if you're if you're a customer you will just receive and have the capability because we'll be serving the entire market with the same solution and we've been, we've been doing that in contract management systems for a long time so that principle definitely stands and no there's no doubt we've touched on it already that the whether we like it or not the regulatory environment is changing and the and the, the, the the need for great, greater amounts of evidence through the 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 customer journey um is there uh, so how do we how do we meet that need without disrupting business models? Uh, you know, that's the that's the key. You know, if you, you know, and every every lender and, and probably increasingly brokers is, is facing this problem. And we have armies of people that are there to sort of collate data and report up, and it often can feel non-value add. I.e., it's not generating income. Uh, you know, you're doing the right thing. You just need to spend an awful lot of time and energy and and, and human human resource to evidence it. Um, but that's the nature of the world and we can sit and complain about it or we can figure out how to make it more efficient and so that it doesn't disrupt our business models so that we can spend our time in the day doing what we want to be doing, like serving customers. And, and, uh, yeah, and that's another important message to consider what's going on at the moment. You've got you know, consumer duty, you've got discretionary commission, you've got the review of the Consumer Credit Act, just to name three. And that's that the broker community is really concerned about at the moment and, um, and, and tech can provide not all the solutions, but definitely some of them. We should look at it as um, can help can help evidence, but also can help um, brokers focus their time where they want to be spending their time and not be, not suddenly lose half their week doing reg reporting. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Edward, thank you, Jason. So Edward, could we have the result of the second poll, please? And the and could you? Yes, there's, the, I've had loads of questions. Absolutely, loads of questions. And there, there was one that 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 came out that I particularly wanted to ask, which was uh, really for an, an example. We talked about um, um, cust uh, being able to drive more business because you've gone digital. And somebody has asked, who's doing it best, you know, or, or what's the example of it being done in the most innovative way of creator of, of opening up a digital, uh, an extra digital uh, um, touch point with with customers. And I wondered if you if you had an example of of what you've seen, Jason, in in, in the work that you do. Um, is it is it auto and, and dealers or, or something of that nature? It, it's, a, it's a tricky one because I think it's. It, if you're asking the question, if the question comes from within the asset finance space, it's very different to the wider leasing market. You know, clearly in the auto finance space, it, there's, there's much more commoditized uh, product, and then there's a much more commoditized asset. So it's much, and, and, and the need for for closing the deal before the customer leaves the the forecourt of the dealership is that much higher. Now we know that's not quite the same in the SME market. The, the, the customers are much more complex. Their needs are more complex. The asset might not be available yet. So it's a different story. The, the, the need for speed is more in you know getting a decision um, back to the to the customer so they're happy and they know they know they've got the right solution in place. So, and in those guys, I don't think there are um, there are people that are out there trying to digitize the entire end to end asset finance journey from the i.e. the customer logging on saying I want uh, and then receiving cash without anybody touching it. It's I think it's thinking about that customer journey. Uh, and identifying where where technology can add value, you know, and that and we touched on that already. So I think I, there are some great examples out there. You know, it's, it's, you know simply asset. They talk an awful lot about the, the strength of their technology and they've got a very good platform on on, on the front end. Um, uh, but they're not trying to digitize the entire customer journey. They're, they're deploying a human expertise model at the front end, and then make you know, it's, it's kind of the principle of, you know wrap around the customer, give them the service you want to provide. But when it comes to executing the deal, you just hit a button. And that's the that's the dream, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, somebody has asked me to shut the poll because it's hiding your face. So I'm going to do that very, very quickly. So the um, customers and vendors will expect brokers to be able to interact digitally uh, via all those uh, different means that we talked about. And an amazing 84% uh, said um, that they agreed or strongly disagreed, which is no great surprise to me. So there, that's hopefully um, gone. Um, okay, um, I have two other questions, which are uh, um, a great lead into what's about to come in the next section. So, um, and I just thought I'd read them out to show that we're following what the, the, the questions from the, the audience are. So do the panel think smaller brokers will pay to employ the uh, technology lenders um, uh, to put in their systems? That's question one. The second question is that, uh, um, is there really a room for an out of the box solution or is everybody, are we looking for widgets to build the broker tech origination platform? So those are the two questions that are coming up. I think they both get dealt with in the next section. So I read them out for that relevance. And here's the question that, that, that uh, we're going to put to you. So here we go. Tech needs to be affordable, deliver immediate value without lots of expensive configuring and the presence of a tech team, um, and which can be ideally built into a fully integrated system uh, um, uh, over time. So we'd like to know whether you agree, strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, wildly disagree. Um, and if you could answer that now, over to you, David. Okay, thanks, Edward. Um... So yeah, so Jason, I'm afraid it's back to you again. So you probably need that you need that drink. But um, the when we were doing the prep for this session, we spoke to quite a lot of brokers, and um, they they were uh, a lot of them said that they felt that they they were having to pay for the technology that the lenders got the benefit for, um, and they felt that that was a little bit no, not a little bit. They thought that was that was unfair um is that something that you you would agree with i mean you when we talked earlier you said that you know metal comes from a kind of uh, you know your main customers are so um is that something is that a kind of a 
a, a structure or cultural difference that you have to make at Netsol to maybe to even out the lender broker relationship to you know who pays who pays for all this technology. I think it's there's a, there's a wider value chain that exists now um, um, uh, uh, in this space. I think you've got to you've got to look at it sort of fairly holistically. You know, and come on to who pays for what in, in a second. But it used to be that you know the only tech that existed in the value chain was the lender's contract management system. Fine, you know, that was all there was. Everything else was done on paper at that point. Now, and then after after that, you know, brokers sorry not brokers lenders started to build portals for brokers to use to help make it easier and. And some of them are really good, and perhaps some of them were designed more for for the lender's benefit. And I'm personally not a fan of going to a hotel and um, and using an online check-in desk. But at the same time, you know, I don't like going to the hotel and joining the back of a queue at a, at, a, at a reception desk waiting to check in. So there's a bit there's a bit of a to and fro on that. But um, but as what what became more challenging for brokers in using lenders portals is when they started to have their own technology platforms you know with it so then a broker says okay I've got, i need to key this 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 prop into my own system because my brokerage needs to run an efficient operation my management wants to have view across all the activity we're a bigger sales force now we're not just three or four guys and girls uh, running the business we're actually a team of 20 so there's a, a need for efficiency in the crm system so i've got a key into my crm system but why have i then got to go and key into lender a's portal or maybe lender b or lender lender c you know that becomes that sort of dual key a bit become becomes a bit of a challenge i'm happy to go into their portal once the deal's been accepted and i'm executing the deal no problem because i know the deal's happening at that point i'm, I'm, I'm earning my commission yeah. um when i'm just having to key in lots it's not 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 a lot of fun and not a lot of use good use of my time so then what happened was uh, the API connection started to, to, to emerge between brokers technology and lenders technology. So you can avoid that keying in bit. So that's a really interesting part of it. Now the, the sort of more latest part of it is with brokers that are increasingly having their own technology systems so because they're, they're including that in their proposition. Brokers have long leaned into the dealer channel uh, for, for, for lead generation, but, you know, but never been really been able to provide technology into that channel. Why? Because they never really had any technology themselves. Uh, so now that brokers have are increasingly having technology within their own businesses, they're now able to deploy technology in their own dealer channels. So that's a really interesting development. Um, so there's a whole value chain there um, uh, that's, that's, that's much more interested in technology and really moving forward uh, leaps and bounds, which is really exciting. As for who pays for, for, for it, I think it's it's I think it's quite straightforward. A, a lender's portal is paid for by a lender. A broker's proposal management system is paid for by a broker. Yeah, so yeah. On that last point, you're quite right. And there's a number of different industries here. I mean, there are industries that develop websites, there's industries that manage the customer journey, there's industries that manage the proposal process. There's a lot of different fintechs that are providing solutions. And we'll kind of come on to this at the end. And you mentioned the word API, which is kind of like the glue that, that brings it all together. I saw you nodding there, Tom. So, I mean, you know, is that is that something you would agree with or or, or do you have a different view? No, no. I, at the beginning of this, I mentioned about this sort of cost anxiety that kind of a lot of brokers can probably relate to when it comes to technology. And, you know, we, we've learned that the hard and fast way, really, where we've kind of seen the the seen the upside of a, a product. And then when we've, when we've actually bought it into the business, the cost to actually fully um, uh, adopt it into the into the business has been quite costly. Um and never and not always resulted in exactly what we hoped and then that casts more anxiety over any future projects so i think the ambition is to work where there is sort of, sort of um, modular based component based tech um i think it's really important i think with the modular based sort of technology approach it means that you can solve uh problems in isolation and grow uh, and grow with it which i, I think is vital um this full end-to-end -end solution concept, which uh, technology providers over years have, have often provided, um, just you, you can't find a business plan for it when it's so costly um, when you're a small brokerage. So uh, I, I think the the more technology providers provide, uh, I said modular component-based tech solutions, you're the more you're going to find brokers gain confidence in 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 uh, utilizing it. Yeah. And Astrid, maybe just come to you. So, I mean, you know, you're a you're a lender, and you are you flexible enough uh, to deal with multiple, um, you know, proposal systems? I mean, is that or, or or would you would you say to a broker, we'd actually prefer you to use System A or System B rather than this one? Or 
I think so we're, you know, ourselves, we're very early on in our in our tech uh, tech journey. Um, we've uh, you know, sort of launched uh, our, our portal. Um, we've worked, uh, you know, with, with a provider to um, you create that. And we're working with a couple of brokers on it. But it's a couple of things. I think the the amount of portals that are um, available now, uh, I always think as a broker, it would be an absolute nightmare. You know, you'd have to have a big long list somewhere of all of your your logins and stuff. And then with the, um, you know, the adoption and the creation of their own, their own tech, um, which is why we have built and decided to go down the route that we have, that we will API link um, with, with brokers, um, with, with our tech, so that we can get more proposals in this way we can't you know we're not of the view that we can force or we we, we don't want to make, make brokers you all need to sign up to this portal over here and you need to send us that's the only way that you can deal with us um it's 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 not the, the approach we're taking um so and we're, we're trying to be flexible to those brokers that just don't want a portal they never want to use a portal fine email it email it into us yeah. okay so, 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 Jason, we've heard a little bit about there about um, about the importance of APIs and, and enabling brokers and lenders to talk to each other using a multitude of different systems, and that's uh, that's probably music to your ears, I would think, really. And, and I think this is a good opportunity now to ask you about Apex now, which um, I mean, I've I've spent quite a bit of time looking at the website. I can't say I'm an expert in Apex now, but perhaps you can just give us a couple of minutes on uh, on that particular product and how it. And how it how it kind of solves this problem of of enabling multiple systems to talk to each other and having that kind of seamless uh, seamless customer journey. That's it. Yeah, happy to. Um, a lot of, a lot of brokers have come from within banks. Um, uh, many many of them have, and they've all been exposed to one tech project to another that's taken an awful long time, cost an awful lot of money, and used a small army of people uh, and delivered kind of not all the value it was intended to end to. So they have an inherent fear of, of, of technology projects and, and brokers are SMEs at the end of the day. They don't have big IT teams, they may not have a CTO or they may not want to have the budgets to, to invest. So what, what we've been able to do and net sole is um, address that problem. Um, we've effectively, the Apex now for everyone's benefit is think of it like a leasing focus, dedicated leasing app store. We've built a, a, a whole series of apps um, that, are, that can be deployed like Lego blocks. So uh, I couldn't agree more with Tom's comments there where he said, you know, you don't have to deliver this big one size solution at the same time. You can start small. You can grab a lease and calculate it down, subscribe to it, pull it down. You can trial it for three months for free um, and just and get used to it and check the value. And then you go, OK, you know, what I want to be able to do is take that quote and send it on a digital document um, to the customer in a really sort of graphical and, and impressive way. Great. I'll, buy, I'll grab another component and they integrate instantly. You haven't got to have big integration projects we've built all these components out there um, that are api enabled in the cloud so you haven't got to host them or deploy them anywhere um, they're highly configurable so you can put all your branding around them and, and, and create the customer journey you want to create uh, and they're like a lego infrastructure you can say oh, i need that one that one and that one and assemble them um, uh, to, the, to the customer journey you're trying to achieve so what we're seeing is a lot a lot of interest in this at the moment where Brokers can access technology in the origination journey uh, and do that without a big tech project and without big budgets. Uh, these are sort of subscription-based products where you can go on, pay on a monthly basis, so you don't have to fork out you know, seven-figure numbers to, to achieve this technology anymore. You used to, but not anymore. And we've built this leasing app store um, that allows us to sort of assemble these things really quickly. Um, so you don't need the kind of full enterprise solution anymore. You can try it, get some value out of it, try the next piece, and de-risk the whole the whole project. So what I mean, what products are in there, Jason? So I mean, um, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the kind of vanilla products that we're all used to now. I'm thinking about electronic signature and ID verification. I mean, they are fairly universal now. So in the in the Apex Now store, I mean, I guess you can get those things, but can you get other stuff as well? Yes, I mean, there's a whole a whole range of of, of components in there to serve different needs. You've got pricing calculators, one called Flex, you know, something called Doc, which is um, uh, Andy has this also, um, where which, which allows you to sort of distribute a document. You can, um, uh, we've got a whole customer journey piece, like you know, imagining the whole kind of the, the flow of the deal. We can go and retrieve quotes and see what the status is. 
Um, there's, a, there's credit components. There is a whole piece around rates and programs. There's a whole component and app that sort of just what is all my pricing components? What 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 are all the commission rates I want to hold uh, for different for different markets? Or, or so there's a, you can kind of hold the metadata in one place. There's a whole range of different apps that can be that are pre-made, ready to go, out of the box, online, subscribable, uh, and they all integrate um, uh, in, in, uh, uh, seamlessly. Plus, we can work with brokers to, 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 to develop uh, uh, the right user experience that goes across all those apps if, if, if the high level of differentiation is wanted. Um, so it's, it's all the, it, it, what's nice about this is we're not, these aren't 12 month projects anymore. You know, we can because we can, we've built all of the, the difficult components we can we can assemble them really quickly and get the ux right you know in weeks and months that sounds really exciting and you're a customer are you jason and yeah. you... yes we've got the um the flex um calculation package mm -hmm. uh we took it um probably late last year it was um we wanted to give our brokers a, a way that they could quote and um you know with some accuracy their customers quickly so we took it we embedded it on our website it was really easy to set up and it's been incredibly well received and it's actually free to the brokers so we talk about who's paying for it well hey not finance paid for that well that's, uh, i think that's probably an excellent point to close the webinar so um uh, that's a that's a great message for the brokers that are listening in. Um, so Edward, I think you've got just a couple of things you need to cover. You need to cover off the poll, third poll question, and there's a couple of other points you want to make. Yeah, yeah. So we had the, the the two questions: Do the the panel think smaller brokers will pay to employ the the technology lenders would desire? And I think that's uh, the answer is they can do it in small bits, and it will be de-risked and and so on. And if it doesn't work, they can put it back and and take another one and and, and move on. And the other one was given that every broker have their own uh, has their own customer journey. Um, are we looking for widgets to build the broker tech origination platform? And the answer is yes. That's uh, precisely what's being offered in in Apex. So moving on to the poll, uh, we've got tech needs to be affordable, deliver immediate value without lots of expensive configuring in the presence of a tech team. And the uh, overwhelming majority, 86%, either strongly agree or agree or, or, or just agree. Nobody disagreed with the statement, which shows I'm writing my polls in a way that you can't answer the other side of it. So, uh, um, but I think that, that nevertheless, the point is there and it's a strong one. Uh, there were two things that I wanted to cover off. Um, the first is um, I want to share the link to the Apex site because it seems to me that that's the sensible next step for you to have a look at the range of products that are available. I think I've just done that in non-slideshow um, style. So let me just move over to that. And I hope that you can see that as a full, full slideshow. Um, we are in the conference that we're running on the 6th of June. Uh, we will be setting up some uh, round tables where lenders and brokers can meet and talk about issues like this. Uh, we would like to hear from you if you would like to come along. We'll be making um, uh, quite a number of places, but early places free of charge to brokers. Uh, the lenders, unfortunately, in a slightly different answer to the, the question that, that uh, Jason answered is the lenders will, will have to pay. Um, so if you'd like to know more about that, drop me um, a note. Um, here's the slide. And the, finally, whilst you're all looking at the slide and trying to make the uh, um, little square work, I wanted to ask each of the members of the panel just to say, if you could invest in one piece of technology for a brokerage, if you were a broker, what would that be? And I wondered if you could to, could answer in turn. So if we could start with Astrid, if I can um, throw that one at you without notice. Yeah. The, uh, the thing for me and would certainly help me sleep at night if I was a broker is uh, that the compliance being able to, um, you know, record an evidence that, you know, I've said and done the right things to that customer at the right time just to remove any, you know, ambiguity that, you know, I, I didn't say this thing. Or I didn't explain the features of this product uh, to them. Um, that's what I would. I would Very good. Say. Thank you, Astrid. Andy. So mine would be, uh, I'd touch back on a few things I said earlier, which would be um, some sort of training and, and education, I think. Um, I think that would be really helpful for, for all everybody to improve efficiencies going forward. Fantastic. Tom, the uh, the, the only broker on, on the group, but we're grateful for you to coming on. So that was good news. 
Um, my, mine would be some form of distribution tooling. Um, so using technology to try and drive sort of impartial or non-biased behavior within brokers as you grow. I think that needs to be at uh, the forefront. So obviously that ties in with the compliance piece as well. Fantastic. And Jason, last word to you as our, our vendor partners in the webcast. I think uh, uh, from a broker's perspective, I think it, 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 to capture data once in the value chain and not waste time uh, later on by rekeying lots of data and focusing that, refocusing that energy on the front end and, and on origination. If you get the tech right, you can do that. Very good. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for attending. If we haven't covered off topics that you wanted to cover, tell us we'll run another uh, session on it. There's clearly a great deal of interest in this topic. Uh, the next big event that's coming up is the 6th of June, which is our main conference, and uh, we'll be sending out details of that shortly, but we've got the Federation of Small Businesses coming and telling us why um, brokers and lenders, they think it's unreasonable that they should be asking for personal guarantees. We've got them coming along to answer why they think that. We've also got a claims management company coming along to say why they think it's all right to... Uh, to, to, to find the industry. So I think there's lots of interesting stuff there. And then uh, in early July, we've got our um, end of uh, uh, the, the first half of the year awards 